Tonight's speaker is Dr. Simon Target. Simon lives in St. Margaret's, and as well as being a committee member of this society, he's a, he's a historian, a journalist, and an author. One of his books is on the bookstore. I highly, highly recommend it to you. <coughs> Simon will talk about the 18th century explorer George Vancouver, who is buried in St. Peter's Churchyard in Petersham. He will explain the importance of Petersham in Vancouver's story, but he will also reveal Vancouver's rather surprising connections with Kew and Richmond. We'll have our usual questions and answers session after Simon has given his talk, and you'll also be mingling for drinks afterwards. So we'll be going downstairs after, after the questions and answers session. Please give a very warm welcome to Simon. Hi everybody, lovely to be here. I spoke at the Society a couple of years ago, but it was in the basement. So being in this rather re lovely refurbished venue is fantastic. Um, when I saw the guitars up there, I thought, my God, do I have to play guitar as well as speak? But thankfully, not tonight. Um, I'm just gonna... So one of the things I've learned uh, as being a member of the, the Society is that local history can not only be local, but it can also be global. Um, you know, the, the local buildings, the local people, if you follow their story, it can sometimes take you on a story, on, on, a, on a trip just around the corner. Also, it can take you on a journey around the world. And uh, there is no more global a story than the story of the person I'm going to talk to you about, uh, George Vancouver. We're all familiar, of course, with his name and the connection with Vancouver Island and city in, in Canada. Uh, but the more I researched his story, both for this talk and for an article in the, in the Society's Journal, I came to realize how truly global a man he was at a time when it, globalization was only just get, getting underway. Um, he died in relative obscurity, which is why we don't really hear about him massively today. But he packed a lot into his short life. He only uh, he died at the age of 40. Uh, but you can see from this portrait, um, uh, which, hangs, which is owned by the National Portrait Gallery, but actually hangs in the uh, Captain Cook Memorial Museum in Whitby, um, that he had great aspirations. If you, I've got this clicker, if you see those books on the bookshelves behind, that one says Cook's Voyages, and that one says Magellan's Voyages. So he really saw himself in that light, and the map here, um, the, sort of the globe here, shows the Canadian coast and the North American coast, which he uh, became famous for navigating, and which I'll talk about uh, now. Um, he was one of the most travelled people of his generation, and he, he went not only to Canada, or what is now Canada, but also to the States, the United States, to South America, to the southern tip of Africa, to Australia, New Zealand, to Hawaii, and to various um, South Pacific islands. So he was a truly well-traveled global figure. Um, but of course, like all lo local history, it starts here. And the reason why we're talking about him really is because he lived the last two years of his life in Petersham, and he died here and is buried, as I'm sure many of you know, in St. Peter's Church in Petersham with this lovely port, uh, Portland stone tomb um, which he was buried in uh, 1798. But his story, actually his story, begins not in Petersham, but in King's Lynn, which was then one of the, the biggest ports in, uh, in England, the fifth biggest port in England, in 1757. Um, and there's a statue to him there. It's interesting there's no statue to him here. And anyway, there's a statue to him here, and he was the son, he came from, his father was a man called John Jasper Vancouver of Dutch Extraction, who was the uh, deputy customs officer, um, and the customs office is just behind here, that's the one that, where his father actually worked and served, and that was actually a very significant job, um, but we've also, by going to Kings Lynn, have the first connection with our locality, uh, just a few months before he was uh, he was born in, in, in June 1757. This man, who, I, who you may recognize, Horace Walpole, uh, was elected to the sort of family seat 
family um, 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 MP's seat of Kings Lynn, his father, Robert Walpole, who's also got strong connections here, um, was an MP there as well before that. And it's likely that uh, uh, Vancouver's uh, father had you know, direct links with, uh, with uh, Horace Walpole, who's of course a very influential man in the second half of the 18th century. And it may be a clue to why he got uh, a leg up in the, uh, our, uh, in the um, Royal Air Force. Royal Air Force? Royal Navy. Well, that, that would have been <laughs> advanced. Royal Navy uh, uh, in the, uh, in the, um, in, when he was very young. We'll come to that sec, second. The other, on his mother's side, and it's always important when you're tracing ancestry to look at both the mother's, the father's side and the mother's side. On the mother's side, he was, had a very interesting heritage. One of his ancestors was this man, Richard Granville, uh, Richard Grenville, and he was um, one of the first heroes of the, of the uh, uh, new Royal Navy in the 1500s. Uh, and he was famous for a number of reasons. One, he um, stood in for Walter Raleigh when Elizabeth heard that Walter Raleigh was going to go and take his colony to America. She said, no, you can't go. You've got to stay with me and um, stay with me in Richmond, in Richmond Palace. And so he sent his very good friend and um, kinsman, uh, Richard Grenville, to uh, Roanoke. And I've just put a map here. It's, Roanoke is roughly there. And you can see here, it's behind the outer banks. You can see it's very well protected. And it was intended to be both a colony and a sort of pirate's lair that the uh, English could raid the Spanish treasure fleets as they went over from the Caribbean to Spain. So that was the first thing. He also fought in the Spanish Armada. Uh, and then he became enduringly famous for um, a rather bizarre suicide mission against the Spanish in, the 15, in 1591. Um, and it might have been forgotten, but for Lord Tennyson, who wrote a poem about it um, called The Revenge, the name of the ship in which he fought. And as you, some of you may know, Lord Tennyson lived in Montpellier Road, um, in, uh, just around the, by the Crown uh, pub in St. Margaret's, on the St. Margaret's Twickenham uh, borders. Uh, with a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a plaque there, you can go and see that. Um, I think he wrote the revenge a little bit after that time. So Vancouver joins the Royal Navy at the age of 13. Um, and um, this was in um, uh, 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 1770. And soon after that, um, he heard about the wonderful voyage, the first voyage of Captain James Cook. I'm sure you'll all know uh, a lot about, and he had three voyages. This was the first voyage, and it would have no doubt fired the young boy's imagination when he had just joined the, uh, the Royal Navy. And um, Cook had gone to the other side of the world to watch the transit of Venus, and I've got a picture of the transit of Venus, which happened, you may remember, in 2012. It happens a couple of times every century. Um, uh, this was now in 1769, uh, the, the transit of Venus was taking place, and it was important for navigational purposes. So Edmund Halley, as in Halley's Comet, had predicted the transit of Venus back in the early 1700s, that it would happen in the 1760s. And so people, people were gearing up. Actually, the year before Captain Cook left in 1769, Tahiti had been discovered at least by the Europeans, and obviously the Polynesians had got there uh, many years before that. Um, and, and he went to Tahiti in order to take a bearing and, uh, and, and watch the transit of Venus uh, happen. Various other uh, expeditions were sent out by others, and they hoped that by tracking the transit of Venus, they could get a precise measurement for the distance between the Earth and the, and the Sun, and therefore improve uh, navigation and direction, particularly on things like longitude, which was very difficult to predict. And you'll know, and I see a few park runners, which is lovely to see, you'll, you'll, you'll know the, the obelisks in, in Park Run, which were put there uh, along with the Royal, built also along with the Royal Observatory for George III, so he could participate in this, uh, the, the watching of the transit of Venus. Um, 
So that was the, one of the reasons why the Cook expedition caught the imagination, but the other one, uh, probably even more so for a young kid, uh, was the work of Joseph Banks, who of course was a member of the Royal Society and was the founder of the uh, and overseer of, of, of Kew Gardens. Um, and he um, went out as the scientist on the Cook expedition, um, a little bit like um, Darwin would on HMS Beagle many years later. And of course, he came back uh, with pictures of the kangaroo, this one by George Stubbs, better known for his horse portraits, and, and of course, Botany Bay. So this was as Vancouver was joining the RAF, uh, uh, the Royal Navy, got to get used to that, <laughs> Royal Navy. Um, uh, but then, so he then joins the, the second um, uh, um, voyage. Have I missed? It's the second voyage. Um, and this had a different mission. So the first mission had to uh, watch the transit of Venus. The second one was to see if they could discover the Terra Australis Incognita, the southern la unknown southern land, uh, which had long been predicted. They thought that if there was you know, a lot of land at the top of the globe, there should be, by definition, lots of land at the bottom. Um, and so you can see the route that he took, uh, Cook, uh, quite low, to about 71 degrees south latitude, very far south, furthest anyone had been, and Vancouver went on this, deeply cold, you've got the roaring 40s, terribly difficult to, uh, to, to navigate. Um, he also went to New Zealand, he went to Tahiti, and he went back, uh, back to, to England that way. They also proved on that voyage that um, uh, New Zealand was indeed an island. Uh, they called it insularity. They proved its insularity. Um, this, this time, Australia uh, was not called Australia. It was called New Holland because it had been discovered by at least the first Europeans to, to reach there had been Dutch. Um, and New Zealand, obviously, also a, 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 um, a Dutch um, province. Um, so this was very much dominated by the Dutch at this point. So the English were trying to get uh, into, the, into, the, um, into the business of Southern Sea Discovery. He travelled uh, Vancouver uh, as a technically, technically as an able-bodied seaman, the, the, the most junior form of sailor. Um, but he uh, um, was given, he was really going to be geared up for being an officer. He was actually classed as a young gentleman and, and given accommodation um, near, near the officers, so they kept a watchful eye on him and his fellow young gentlemen. He was lucky enough to be invited to uh, join the third voyage, and great, don't forget there's great competition to join these, these expeditions, um, and he had various connections to be able to do that. This time the mission was to um, go in search of the Northwest Passage, uh, which I've talked to the Society about before, but this was the fabled passage that they thought would exist through the top of um, uh, the, the, with North America. Uh, it, they, again, they thought that there would be some sort of symmetry. So the Magellan Straits are down here. They thought there must be some equivalent passage between uh, at the Atlantic and the Pacific through the north. Um, uh, he, it, it wasn't found on that occasion, um, but in, what they did find for the first time was were the uh, Hawaiian Islands, the archipel Hawaiian archipelago here, uh, which they named the Sandwich Islands after the Earl of Sandwich, who was also the man who gave, who you know, who gave his name to the eponymous uh, lunch uh, um, as well. And um, this was the voyage where Captain Cook was killed. And Vancouver, age 21, was given a role uh, amongst about uh, 10 other people to go and f find the dismembered body of Captain Cook and bring it back and, 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 and it was in, it was, uh, he was buried at sea. A lot of his body was buried at sea. Um, that would have been a very um, awakening moment, I'm sure. He came back, um, uh, the, the expedition came back, but not before... Um, he did some additional uh, surveying, and this uh, was important. One of the reasons why Cook was given the command of the first voyage was because he was a great cartographer. He had earned his spurs in the, um, in the Battle of Quebec and helped General Wolfe navigate um, 
um, the, the, the rivers around Quebec, um, and on the basis of that was given the command of, the, uh, of his first voyage. Similarly, and Vancouver was given great instruction and really learned at the, the knee of, of Cook about how to, um, how to map uh, and chart the, um, the, the, coasts, the coasts. And here um, there's, a, there's a map, a very rare map that's been found recently that's in the, one of the U university libraries in, in America, the University of uh, Wisconsin, Milwaukee. And um, here you can see the... Uh, the um, the North, uh, the Atlantic, uh, sorry, the Alaskan coast, and I've found a, um, a Google map just to give you an idea of where this is. Uh, it's here it's called Sandwich Sound. It was soon renamed Prince William Sound. Will William was the, the, the man who would become William IV. He was the third son of George III. Um, uh, then there was Point Possession, Point Possession, and here I've circled where Anchorage is, which of course is the capital of, uh, of Alaska. And here you can just trace he, he not only had to do the, the coast, but he also had to trace the, the route taken by the endeavour and the discovery, the ships of the expedition. And here you can see his signature. Um, that was on the, the front there. So, for the next 10 years, he came back in 1780, got his... Uh, um, his commission as a lieutenant and spent the next 10 years in the Caribbean um, and working his way through the, through the, the top ships. Um, and then finally in 1790, he was given his command of his own cook-like voyage. Um, and this um, expedition had a number of objectives, um, just as the Cook expeditions had. The first objective was to map the coastline from San Francisco through Vancouver Island, it wasn't called Vancouver Island then, of course, up to the Alaskan coast, pretty much where that previous map was, was done, um, which is about 10,000 miles when you follow each of the, the little coves, uh, coves and inlets and so on, which he had to do with the little boats, not with the main ships. A terribly dangerous uh, work. So this is the first objective to, to do this, and the reason was to lay claim to the, uh, the area. The Spanish had historically claimed the whole of the coast, Pacific coast, from the very tip, from Cape Horn all the way up to Alaska, even though they hadn't settled and so on. That was just a historical thing. Um, and then in the north, the, the Russia, Russian Empire was going over here, and of course it did eventually uh, dominate Alaska from it for, uh, until the mid-1850s, until it was sold till it sold to the Americans. Um, so that was the first uh, objective, and it was going to be a huge task, of course. Um, the second objective um, was to search for the elusive Northwest Passage, which I was mentioning before, and this is a, a map just to give you a clear idea. This is from um, east to west, uh, but the belief was not that, um, that it would go through the, um, the sort of Atlant uh, the, um, Canadian Arctic, but that it would go from somewhere, like, somewhere like this. They thought it would go somewhere like that. And this is roughly at 60 degrees latitude north. And this was where uh, Vancouver was instructed to reach in his survey from San Francisco up to here. The belief was that if there was this navigable route, it would, would, um, would um, uh, speed up the, the, the link between Britain and ideally China, which was the largest economy in the world at the time. The third reason was to lay claim and establish a kind of settlement uh, on what Sir Francis Drake had called Nova Albion uh, back 200 years earlier. Nova Albion means, of course, New England. Albion is the ancient word for England. It also comes from the Latin meaning white. And when Francis Drake had also gone in search of the Northwest Passage 200 years earlier, he was reminded when he looked at the coast north of San Francisco and the cliffs of the white cliffs that he had seen, last seen when he bid farewell to, to England in, the, in, 70, in 1577. Um, at, the time, Cook, at the time, Drake came back and um, was, the, was the hero. He came to Richmond, to the palace in Richmond, where he told uh, Elizabeth 
what he had found, including that he'd laid claim to this land uh, in Nova Albion. And he had a medal, silver medal struck, which is, this one's in the British Museum, and you can just see, if you uh, train your eyes, Nova Albion he had uh, marked on. And of course, it wasn't just the, the, the bit of coast that he'd landed on, but it was right away across the north of America. So he was trying to claim the whole of North America, really. Um, many years later, uh, when the, British came, the English came to uh, settle in um, North America on this side, they looked at the latitude, and in honor of Drake's effort, they named that area New England. He was also uh, trying to uh, lay claim not only to uh, Drake's um, uh, achievement, uh, but also uh, there was consideration of maybe creating a penal colony. Um, in 1788, the first fleet had arrived in Botany Bay and then soon after was established, this is in New South Wales, uh, a penal colony, the first penal colony, and of course Australia dates its origin back to 1788. And there was thought that maybe they could have another one um, uh, in the North Pacific. And the fourth reason was um, a sort of diplomatic reason uh, for, um, for the mission. Um, Nootka Sound is here, and it was a, um, first discovered again by, in, in the European context by Captain Cook. And when he arrived in, on his third voyage, um, his sailors uh, uh, killed a few sea otters and sold the pelts to the Chinese, made a fortune, and suddenly that awakened the whole fur trade in sea otters and um, um, uh, prompted a real uh, focus not by the Russians, by the Spanish, by the Americans, all to this area. The, the British were um, amongst the first, and they established a kind of trade, an informal trading post here. Um, which the Spanish took exception to, and in the late 1780s uh, um, arrested the, the traders, removed their possessions uh, and their claim to the territory. And this caused the ire, caught the ire of, of the British, who said no. Uh, there, there was some real warmongering. They created a, an armada, which they called the Spanish um, Armament, uh, in conscious echo of the Spanish Armada, and at that, the, the Spanish uh, backed down and um, uh, uh, Vancouver, uh, amongst other things, was sent out there to, to uh, ex accept their peace offering uh, and work with a man called Don Juan Cadra, whose name will come up again in, in a moment. The reason why I put this man here, not only uh, uh, Tom Hardy, um, who's a local resident, um, but you may remember a program uh, five years ago called Taboo, and that centered on the fur trade and Nootka Sound. So I thought maybe some of you may be remembering, may have remembered that, and that helps you to sort of place that story. So I'm going to take a pause for a minute. So we've, we've seen what the, um, the, the objectives of his third voyage were, um, but I just wanted to get a sense of the sense, scale of the achievement uh, of what he was about to embark upon and what he eventually achieved. He went in a ship called the Discovery and a, an accompanying ship, but his flagship was the Discovery, which is a relatively new sloop of war uh, built in 1789 in Rotherhithe. Um, and it was named after Cook's second ship in the second voyage of the Discovery. Um, and it was remarkably small when you think about it. It was just 99 feet long, 28 feet in beam wide, and it, it took 100 people. 100 people were stuffed onto this relatively small ship, plus provisions and victuals and so on. 16 officers, 84 men. Um, this is uh, the plan that uh, is in the, the National Maritime Museum. Uh, a beautiful drawing. Here's a model of it to give you a sort of sense of what it actually looked like. Um, and in the course of that four, nearly five year journey of those 100 people, he lost just six people which at a time when you have scurvy and high mortality, not just uh, at sea, but also at land, that was a remarkable achievement. He again took his inspiration from Captain Cook, who was famous for um, treating his um, 
his, his sailors well, giving them fresh fruit, fresh food, um, sauerkraut famously in vitamin C and so on. Uh, but he really learned his lesson from Cook and that, that was one of the great uh, achievements of his, uh, of his voyage. Um, the second thing to bear in mind is just the scale of the journey that he was involved in. Overall, he traveled 65,000 miles, that's rough calculation. Um, in addition, another 10,000 for the small boats that tracked and surveyed the coast from San Francisco to Alaska. Um, but I, I still can't believe these, in these journeys. I mean, we think of, Aust we say Australia and New Zealand almost together in the same breath, don't we? But, you know, to go from Sydney uh, to, to Wellington is 1,300 miles. That's kind of akin from going from London to Tunis, and we certainly don't put London and Tunis in the same breath. From Wellington to Chat the Chatham Islands here, uh, about 500 miles. Uh, from here to uh, the Society Islands, which is basically Tahiti, it's 2,400 miles. From here to Hawaii, it's four, nearly, uh, well, just over 3,000 miles, and then another nearly 3,000 miles up, and I couldn't even get it on, the, on that same map, to, to Vancouver. So they were extraordinary journeys that they were doing, uh, and hence the need for great navigation and great skills, great board management, ship management, and so on. Now, I'm turning to Richmond now and, and Peachum because where we know the story of Va Vancouver is really through the book that he wrote, The, the Voyage of Discovery, uh, a, a four-volume publication um, which can still be read in sort of dusty libraries. Um, so I'm going to come on to some of the achievements of the voyage there, but I wanted to get to Richmond, which is where he started writing. So after he came back from his voyage um, uh, in um, 1795, uh, he then repaired to this place, the Star and Garter. This, of course, doesn't look like the Star and Garter we're all used to, but this was the original one, but in pretty much the same place, overlooking the lovely Peachum Meadow. And it was here that um, he, Vancouver, fell in love with the place. And it's, this is, could be an apocryphal story or a quote we don't know. It doesn't sound very, West, it doesn't sound very Norfolk. But anyway, here he says, In all my tra travels, I never clept eyes on a more beautiful spot than this. Here I would live, and here I would die. That was supposedly a quote that he was heard saying from uh, the, the uh, owner of the, the Star and Garter. Um, but whether it's true or not, whether he said those words um, or not, what's not in doubt is the fact that within two weeks of arriving at the Star and Garter, he was making his way down to Peachum, to the place where he uh, lived and died and worked. And that's these buildings in River Lane. Some of you may recognize it, recognize them. Um, so if you go from the Thames up River Lane, nearly to the end, on the right, you'll see these two buildings. Now, uh, at one point, these were one building. So they're two properties now, each worth about five million quid. Um, and, uh, but they were one property in the past, both listed. And it's probable that Vancouver had them both. Um, they've since had some famous or uh, relatively famous tenants uh, or owners. Uh, Glen Cottage, the one on the left, um, was uh, Jeffrey Powell. That's not a spelling mistake, that's actually how he spelled his name. He's one of the architects of the Barbican. And then Navigator's House, which was originally Craig Mile Cottage, so I think Chris Brasher, the Olympian and broadcaster, renamed it cleverly uh, with a sort of marketing eye to the Navigator's House. Um, and um, uh, this is where uh, Vancouver lived as a tenant. Um, it was still part of the uh, Dysart estate back then. I put another picture. Uh, this is a, a, a pen and ink drawing taken, done in about the 1940s. And it gives you a better, in a sense, idea of how the two buildings sat next to each other as, as one. Um, but I've also put two other interesting documents. One is uh, a letter, and there are several letters by uh, Vancouver in the archives uh, where he signs his name, George Vancouver, and also puts his address, Petersham, uh, here. I just amplified that. And of course, this is where he wrote his book in three volumes. And it's called A Voyage of Discovery to the North Pacific Ocean and Round the World, in which the coast of Northwest America has been carefully examined and accurately surveyed 
undertaken by His Majesty's command, um, principally with a view to ascertain the existence of any navigable communication between the North Pacific and North Atlantic Oceans, that's the North West Passage. And he did it in all these years um, in these uh, uh, ships here. And so when you read his uh, uh, magnum opus, we learn a number of things. First, he did manage to chart the coastline, the 10,000 um, miles of coastline, uh, and his maps were so accurate that they were still being used 100 years later, which is an extraordinary uh, thing. Um, he did establish, beyond all reasonable doubt, that there was no Northwest Passage through the North American continent. Now, some of you may know there's now a great debate about whether at some point there, there will be a navigable route through the Northwest, through at least the high Canadian Arctic as a result of climate change, and a number of boats have made it through, um, sort of icebreaker-type boats, um, in the summer months. Uh, and it may be that maybe in a few years' time um, that will become more navigable. But certainly at that point, and in the spirit of the sense that it needed to be through the, through the, through the land, in a sense, not through the, the high Arctic, um, he was correct. Um, he also claimed um, some lands for future settlement, uh, which he named New Georgia. Now, again, you probably can't see that, but there's New and then Georgia down here. And this is basically lands which now straddle America, or the United States, and Canada, uh, Oregon, Washington State, and British Columbia. Um, and it's interesting because this is, he did this in about 1792, laid claim to these lands. Um, and about 10 years earlier, 1783, Britain signed a peace treaty uh, or, and, uh, with, the, with America at the end of the American War of Independence. And of course had lost a colony called Georgia, one of the 13 colonies, and now they were trying to establish another colony, potentially, on the other side of the American, North American continent. So they hadn't given up uh, laying claim to America. Um, what he didn't do was settle the Nootka Sound dispute, although he remained in cordial relationships, uh, uh, maintained a cordial relationship with the Spanish diplomats, Juan Cadra, to the extent that they named their island that, they, that Vancouver was the first to discover was an, an island. Um, Kadra and Vancouver's Island, can you see that there? Uh, and it was only through time that the Kadra was lost, uh, it was dropped and Vancouver became the, the most commonly used uh, name for it. Another interesting thing that we learn when reading the Magnum Opus is that Vancouver, who um, had had that grim experience in Hawaii with Captain Cook, returned there, mapped it in great detail and befriended the, the king, King Kamahamaha I, um, and um, formed good relationships with him, and uh, to the extent that he sought the protection of Britain um, and was willing to cede, or potentially cede, uh, control to the British in return for protection against the incursions of Americans and Spanish and so on. And, he, and Vancouver had helped uh, king Kamahamaha uh, to unify the uh, archipelago, the eight, the main, eight main islands. Um, and, and I think it's worth m making the point that, of course, this is a period of great colonialism and so on, um, but Vancouver was renowned for respecting indigenous peoples, and you can go to the British Museum, for instance, and see many artifacts that he, he and his, uh, um, his uh, f fellow sailors brought back, uh, it, having been exchanged uh, in trade with, with local peoples. So I'm now going to come to a number of connections which really uh, surprised me, put it that way, and I certainly didn't find them in any biographies of Vancouver. So I've called this slide the O'Higgins connection, and indeed the next one, but on the way back, he was returning from Vancouver Islands, and he was going to go round Cape Horn, back up the Atlantic and up to, uh, to England. And on the way down, the mast, his main, main mast, uh, was either broken or needed repair. So he, put, he called in at this port, uh, Valparaiso, uh, Paradise Valley. And um, here's a picture drawn by his on-board artist here 
of, of Valparaiso. And of course, the Spanish were very suspicious about his, um, his arrival. This, of course, was part of the Spanish Empire, Chile, at this point. Um, and so he was invited to San Diego, this journey here, to San Diego, which was the capital of the Chile, to meet this man, who was the governor of Chile, who was an Irish Spaniard called uh, Don Ambrosio O'Higgins. I have to really try and say it. Ambrosio Rice, but anyway, uh, Don Ambrosio O'Higgins. And he was born Ambrose Bernard O'Higgins in Ireland, but um, found his way as a soldier uh, in the Spanish forces and, um, and worked his way up and became, as you can see, rather grand. Um, but I'm sure some of you will be suspecting why I'm mentioning O'Higgins here, because as you'll find out in this slide, he was the father of, um, of th this man, Bernardo O'Higgins, who was his Ill illegitimate son, who of course you can see as a statue um, by Thai, Thai, just by Thai Tables Cafe. Um, and uh, when, um, when Vancouver arrived in Valpre Val Valparaiso in about 1795, this man, young man, was just starting out as a scholar at this place here, which is a building just around the back of uh, the vineyard school. Uh, you can see the little blue plaque so you can go and find it. And this was a school back in the 1790s where he studied uh, for a number of years, learning English and also learning something of the being inspired by the uh, American uh, War of Independence because in the end, Bernardo O'Higgins became the great uh, independence um, freedom fighter for Chile, breaking away from, um, uh, from, uh, from the Spanish Empire. Um, another curious fact is this, um, this building, this house, was once owned apparently by Brian Blessed, the actor, uh, who I noticed when I was reading a, a curious interest in birthdays. It's his birthday today, but there we go. Um, so that's the O'Higgins connection, but there's an additional element to this story. So when they went to Valparaiso and then went to San Diego, which is about 90 miles, um, one of the people that Vancouver took with him was the onboard scientist, a bit like Banks, Joseph Banks for, to Cook. Um, this man was a Scottish scientist, botanist called Archibald Menzies, Mingus maybe, um, who had um, uh, been instructed by uh, banks to go and bring back uh, any uh, fauna and flora that he could uh, that could be used uh, in the case of um, flora in Kew Gardens for the Royal, Royal Gardens. And so when um, he was sitting, there was a, a large banquet thrown for the, for the English uh, sailors and he was offered these pine nuts and he thought, hmm, should I eat them or should I keep them? He decided to put them in his pocket and then he took them back when they got back to Valparaiso to, his, um, um, to, the, to the ship and where he had a onboard greenhouse. I just don't know how they managed to get a greenhouse and we, with all the hundred people and the victuals and so on. Anyway, they managed to uh, and of course he s sewed them and waited to see what happens. By the time he got back, they were turning into what's botanically is called the Araucaria araucania. Um, but better known as the monkey puzzle tree. And this was the first uh, monkey puzzle tree to come into England, introduced by uh, Archibald Menzies. Um, Archibald Menzies gave it to his, his, his mentor, uh, Joseph Banks, who had it taken to, um, uh, to Kew Gardens. This isn't the one, but this is the one that exists now. And if you go and visit it, it's just nearby the Elizabeth Gardens. There's a lovely plaque which says something about the history of the monkey puzzle tree and shows how endangered it is in, it is in its natural habitat. Um, interestingly, uh, Joseph Banks, who also had an estate in Spring Grove, which is in Isleworth, had, had a monkey puzzle tree planted there, though it didn't last as long. The one that um, was planted in Kew lasted until 1892, extraordinary. Um, now, I've put these other uh, pictures up because you may recognize this person if you are a regular goer to Kew Gardens, but there's a lovely uh, 
um, display of Marion Moore's paintings. And she was sent out partly at the, uh, at the, um, on the advice of Darwin to South America uh, to um, look at the fauna in their natural habitats. And she did this picture of the monkey puzzle tree. So while he was writing, how are we doing for time? While he was writing these, um, these, uh, this, the, these many words for his voyage, um, a, a ghost from the past came back to haunt him. Um, when he was captain of the, of, of the uh, discovery, he, like many captains, feared being a victim of, uh, like Captain Bly was, of a mutiny. Um, the mutiny on the bounty, bounty took place in 1789, so not so long ago, it was deep in the memory. Um, uh, and uh, the mutiny on the bounty was caused by people living it up in Tahiti and enjoying the hospitality, let's say, of the local people. And, um, and then when they, get, they got back uh, in the ship and were not happy with the discipline of Captain Bly, sent him packing on that incredible voyage uh, where, you know, of course, he was expected to die, but didn't. Um, Vancouver, then, was a huge, dis big disciplinar disciplinarian and regular ordering, regular floggings of recalcitrant sailors, one of whom was this man called Thomas Pitt, who was a midshipman, a sort of junior officer, and he was this man here, who looked a rather dandyish figure, and he was a rather dandyish figure. He was only uh, 16 or 17 at this time, um, uh, uh, but he was um, accused of repeated misconduct. Conduct. In his case, the mis misdemeanor was, was uh, pilfering iron and other tradable goods for, and, and seeking the um, sexual favors of the Tahitian women. Uh, eventually, um, he was not only flogged, but he was eventually sent home uh, when, the, um, when Vancouver got to Hawaii on a, on a supply ship. Um, and that decision came back to haunt Vancouver. He probably forgot all about it, this junior officer who was uh, you know, misbehaving. But when he got back home, he discovered that that um, snotty-nosed teenager had been elevated to the peerage as the second Earl of Camelford. And that was not just any old earldom. Um, he was um, extremely well-connected. You'll recognize maybe the, the name Pitt. Uh, he was a cousin of the Prime Minister, William Pitt the Younger. He was a, a brother-in-law of uh, the Foreign Secretary. Uh, and he was extremely rich, thanks to his namesake, Thomas, Smith, Thomas Pitt, uh, who, uh, who um, was the governor of Madras, now Chennai, um, and who discovered the Pitt, or rather bought the Pitt, the so-called Pitt Diamond, where, which was then renamed, having been bought by the French Regency, uh, the Regent Diamond, and is today on display in the Louvre. But of course, that was the basis for his huge wealth, and he was going to use it in a personal vendetta against Vancouver. When Vancouver got to, he got to Pichem, of course, he thought he was in a little hideaway that, nobody, that no one would be able to find him, really. Uh, it, unfortunately, Pitt pursued him all the way to Petersham because Pitt used to live in Petersham. Uh, this building here, which no longer exists, is called Petersham Lodge. Uh, a very grand building built by Burlington and redesigned by Sir John Soane, the builder of uh, the Bank of England. Um, and it was pretty much where, opposite where the Dysart Arms is now, at the entrance of, of, of Richmond Park. Um, the, the King Henry's Mound, for instance, was part of its gardens. Um, and so he knew this area very well. And one day in September 1796, he made his way from his London uh, lodgings to Petersham, knocked on the door at, uh, uh, at the property in River Lane. And, and of course, um, Vancouver opened it and was sh shocked to find uh, the man who had been the snotty-nosed recalcitrant uh, midshipman, now this earl, the proud earl, uh, who um, demanded satisfaction and wanted a duel. Um, now, Vancouver refused. Uh, he said, basically, that the, uh, you know, his job as an officer was not, was not to be confused with his job, uh, with, with any sort of personal um, malice against Pitt. Um, but uh, he 
Thomas Fitt was not happy with this, and so one day he stalked uh, um, Vancouver in a London street and gave him a beating. And you can see uh, this is uh, Vancouver, this is Pitt, this is Vancouver's brother John, who was trying to defend uh, Charles, rather, who was trying to defend him. Um, you can see references to the sea otters. This is the shawl that, uh, that, that the Hawaiian king gave um, in Vancouver. This is a, a cartoon by Gilray, and it was the talk of the town, James Gilray, famous cartoonist. Um, eventually, Pitt was bound over to keep the peace, but really, Vancouver never lived it down. He didn't live, have much longer to live, and he was never able to clear his name as he hoped he would be able to. And he died uh, unable to clear his name, and as a result of that, in relative obscurity, um, um, people weren't keen to, to remember him. Um, Soon after uh, his will became available, when he died in 1798, his, publication, his book was published after, posthumously. It was finished by his, his brother, uh, another brother, John. Um, and of course, we're stand, I'm standing here today talking to you about Vancouver, but I might well not have done if he'd lived a little bit longer, because this will, which is in the National Archives, tells the story of how he hoped to be, uh, uh, he was planning to be engaged in the his estate was going to be used for the purchase and improvement of Ealing Manor Farm in Berkshire. In other words, although he had that lovely um, uh, um, quote about, you know, here I, would here I would wish to live and here I would wish to die, actually it turns out that he was planning to probably, or tantalising evidence suggests he was planning to leave um, and, um, and relocate to Berkshire. But rather end on that, I wanted to end on a couple of the legacies, because he, as I say, died in relative obscurity, but his memory um, really grew soon after he died. So the first thing I'd point to, the first thing I'd point to is the Hawaiian flag. You may notice something quite striking about the Hawaiian flag, this in the Canton. And so in 1816, his friend, who is roughly the same age as him, Kamahamaha I, commissioned a new flag for what was then the unified kingdom of Hawaii. He insisted on using the Union flag, and this has remained the Hawaiian flag, even when Hawaii joined the, became the 50th state of the United States in 1959. And it's the only state flag that features a foreign uh, flag as well. That's a remarkable tribute by his old friend, the King of Hawaii. The second legacy is to do with the Hudson's Bay and um, all the mapping that he did in this area on the coast, this Vancouver Island, allowed, gave the, the Hudson's Bay Company, and here's Hudson's Bay, and this was the extent of its territory, traditional territory, but on the back of the uh, discoveries and exploration of Vancouver, they, they spread further to the coast uh, and to this area here, sort of what is now Washington State and Oregon. Uh, and they built their trade, Western Trading Fort, which they named Fort Vancouver, um, in 1825. And in 1841, the, um, the uh, Hudson's Bay Company uh, presented the church, St. Peter's Church, and you can go and see this, with a memorial uh, to Vancouver in recognition of their long-standing connection. Another um, connection... Did I miss one? Yes. Another connection, um, a legacy, is his role in establishing the border between Canada and, um, uh, and, the, and the United States. Now, you'll know that the border is along, presumably, the, the 49th parallel. But at one point, there was this uh, ongoing de debate about whether it should be here, which is why the British claimed it to be, which was basically where uh, the southern elements of southernmost part of New Georgia, or as was Nova Albion, or as the Americans wanted, right up here. <laughs> and and had, had, had the British conceded, Canada would not have had a Pacific coast. And they were, at one point, the Americans were uh, warmongering. They were caught, their slogan was 5440 or fight. They were going to fight if the British didn't give in to 5440. But in the end, 
Uh, they, uh, and one of the reasons why the Americans were so determined was because of this here, the Oregon Trail. And from the, 1730, from the 1830s onwards, there were huge numbers of people, uh, um, te teeming numbers of people going into uh, the Western parts of America along the Oregon Trail. And so in a sense, you know, the numbers of people made that claim very, very powerful. But nevertheless, as a result of the navigation work that um, Vancouver had done all that time and had kind of proved Britain's prior claim, the US backed down. And also, they, were, they didn't want to fight on, on two fronts and they were starting to get engaged in the fight to take Texas, which they'd already annexed in, in, in the fight with, the, with Mexico. So they backed down. And so to this day, the... Um, the, the, uh, the, the border is the 49th parallel with that little uh, crinkle here to allow um, Vancouver, the island, uh, to be in Canada. Interestingly, here, roughly about here, was Fort Vancouver. Fort Vancouver is now in America. The fourth legacy, um, I've got a couple more, is the founding of Vancouver City. Vancouver Island, of course, was what he named. Uh, uh, Vancouver City was named in his honour, and, um, uh, and it was named in his honour by the Canadian Pacific Railway, and they created the city uh, as the uh, western terminus of the transcontinental railway. And, and you could argue that uh, by Vancouver being named, uh, having, his, having a city named after him, that he was somehow linked to a kind of Northwest Passage, a link between the Pacific, uh, a, a link between Atlantic, St. John's, Newfoundland, all the way across to Canada, uh, to, to the Canadian uh, West and, and Vancouver. Um, this is a, a wonderful picture. Uh, this is the first transcontinental train to get through in 1887. That was the year of Victoria's, Queen Victoria's golden jubilee, 50 years on the throne. And you can see here it says ocean to ocean and Victoria Jubilee and lots of decoration. And the last th thing I'm going to talk about here is the, is the fifth legacy, which he put so many places on the map. He put about 400 places on the map, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the US, um, of which about nine, t nine out of 10 have, have remained. Uh, one of which is, and I've got a picture here of of, of Mount St. Helens, named after uh, uh, Lord St. Helens, who was the British ambassador to Spain. And you'll remember probably the, the volcano going off in 1980. This is what it was before, and this is what it was after. It was the worst, um, uh, uh, most disastrous volcanic um, eruption in American history. And so we come back to where we started with Vancouver's tomb. Um, and in a sense, if anything testifies to the revival of Vancouver's memory, it is this, his tomb. That's the reason why we're here, to be able to talk about him now. But also, um, it, it also has gone on its own kind of journey. Um, it was restored, it fell into great uh, uh, dilapidation, but it was restored in the 1960s, thanks to the people of British Columbia. Um, and I found this Pathé News broadcast. This is actually from the 1930s, where you've got the mayor of Vancouver visiting, visiting um, you can just see the, the, um, the tomb here, uh, with a, a wreath. Um, and then he's remembered every year on a Sunday, nearest the date, with that wreath-laying service. And it's regularly attended by the mayor of Richmond, the naval attaché of the Can Canadian High Commission, people from Kings Lynn, where he was born, and the Sea Scouts, which I think is lovely, who provide a kind of guard of honour, and in a sense, with that youth element to it, um, may suggest that you know, his, his memory will, will, will now live on longer, and it's safe, hopefully it's safe in their hands. Thanks very much for hearing, and uh, I, I'm, I can stay around for questions. What a great talk. Um, I should have mentioned that Simon and I first met about, about five years ago. Probably, yes. We go most Saturdays to Old Deer Park Park Run, where Simon runs. I do a very slow jog. But there's about a dozen people in the front here. Yeah. 
over there. And the back, yeah. more of them, more like about 15, 20 people, who are here to, sit, to, here to hear Simon. So thank you very much for coming. We've got 104 people in the hall, I think about 20 people on Zoom. So a very good turnout. That's great. Yeah, thank you. Brilliant. So, questions. Um, David Williams, um, former councillor for Ham and Petersham. Ah. Um, one of my great frustrations is that there is no blue plaque in yes. River Lane. And uh, in the disgraceful way that blue plaques have been not uh, put up, uh, there is no blue plaque anywhere in Petersham to any of the famous people that live there, and only one in Ham when the Greater London Council was responsible for them, and the then member for Richmond on the Greater London Council uh, lobbied aggressively and made the Greater London Council put up a plaque for Cardinal Newman. And that's the only blue plaque in Hammond Petersham. So can I urge the society to try and do something about remedying this serious deficiency? If there's surely somebody in Hammond Petersham that deserves a blue plaque apart from Cardinal Newman, it must be George Vancouver. Yes, no, agree. And uh, English heritage are very slow and uh, pernickety about all this, that several local councils, not Richmond, have started putting up their own blue plaques, which are uh, unofficial copies of the blue plaque design, but is a, it looks like a blue plaque, and that's what they're doing out of frustration. But if this can be pursued, I would be very grateful. I've had a, a, a long series of uh, failures at getting anywhere with this, so you're very welcome to take over the, the challenge. But it, if anybody deserves a blue plaque, in Hammond Petersham, surely it is George Vancouver. I fully agree. No, absolutely. Thank you. Next question, please. Oh, yes. Jeff. Jeff. Simon, did, um, did he ever meet Napoleon or chat to Napoleon? Because Napoleon's beginning to build his power base. And, in the I don't think he did. I mean, Napoleon didn't really come to power until the early 1800s, 1803. So, although... Um, so I'm, I, I think he just died too early. But give him another 10 years, he might well have done. He might have well fought. But, but then the whole Montpellier Road connection and, and the French coming over after the French Revolution, it must have been quite a big issue locally that the French were coming over because of, you know... Um, that's true. But but I, I, that's true. Um, but I think he, I mean, he died in 1798, so it wasn't really... Uh, the, I think the, the French royal family came over a little bit later in the early 1800s. The um, print there of the Star and Garter. Yes. Was it a hotel or? A but, but that's a good question. It, it of course became a hotel, but it, initially it was an inn. So it was a rather upmarket inn, but it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't the salubrious place that it is now. Definitely not. Um, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. All um, the thousands of miles that the ship travelled. Uh, what was the average speed? Any, any idea? Oof. 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 That's, a good, that's a good question. I honestly, yeah, honestly do not know. I don't think there was an average speed because um, um, I, where, where they would have calculated it, presumably they might have done, but um, uh, uh, yeah, yes. no idea. Good question. Shirley. Um, do we know anything about uh, Vancouver's private life? Did he have any family at all and why did he die so young do we know very good questions um so he, he he died unmarried he wasn't married he spent most of his life at sea so he didn't have much chance to get married really he, he i think there was a period of about 15 months when he was land bound but for pretty much the age of 13 through to 40 he spent most of his life at sea He was like one of those albatrosses that never sort of that never land um so that, he had uh, two brothers, Charles and John. John um, uh, helped him write and finish the book. Charles was there on that cartoon with James, Gil, uh, James Gilray defending him and giving as good as he got. <clears throat> and, um, and then he had two sisters, uh, who, after whom he named um, some points on the Canadian coast. Um, but he didn't marry, didn't have... Uh, um, you know, didn't have children, obviously, um, and uh, was hoping, I think, to, to settle down in Berkshire uh, in this lovely Ealing manor, um, but, but didn't. Why did he die? 
And, and he died, he did, he, why did he die? All sorts of speculation, really, because um, you know, he wasn't given an autopsy. Uh, but um, uh, it was thought that he probably died of some kind of um, disease caught while he was serving in the Caribbean. So he served in the Caribbean from the... So a, a lingering um, um, uh, um, disease that he caught while he was in... The, this was between 1780 and 1790. There's also some suggestion that he had a, a kind of thyroid thyroid uh, complaint. So he was rena renowned as being rather um, quick-tempered uh, and became unusually quick-tempered th throughout the journey. Now, you might assume that's just a normal thing on a, in, in a, on a ship with 100 people, uh, but some um, American naval doctors have suggested that it could be a, a, thy a thyroid problem that then, um, you know, let, let him be more quick-tempered and probably led him to that, um, uh, that dispute with Thomas Pitt, who was only a teenager, after all, when he was you know, being recalcitrant. Some questions here. Thank you for a fantastic talk. Um, as the vicar of St. Peter's Petersham, ah. it's particularly delicious to hear the story in more depth. And can yeah. I welcome you all in May to our service to come and join us? Our details yes. will be on the website. Um, can I ask why was he so poor at the end? In, that my, in my sense is that despite his success, he was actually not only his, his reputation was poor, but um, he didn't have much funds, or is that not correct? Well, he, so, um, I mean, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't poor poor, uh, but he wasn't as well-to-do as he might have been born into. Um, his estate at the end of his life was valued at £5,000, which today is about, you know, £800,000, although it's quite difficult to compare with that. Um, again, he didn't have any land that he was, you know, and he spent most, uh, most of his time at sea. Um, so he, he, he didn't really have any base, so that's perhaps the reason. He didn't marry, and often men would marry into families to, to get wealth. Um, and um, so I, I don't think he was poor, poor, but I think he also hoped that he would become a sort of small landed proprietor with this Ealing Manor farm. Um, yeah. And I think, so just finally, I think he also hoped that the, the book would sell. Uh, but he, but he had to pay for a lot of the publishing himself and then claim the money back from the Admiralty. So by the time he died, I'm sure he didn't get all the money that he deserved. Um, my question sort of follows on a bit from that. Yeah. Can you hear me? Is this working? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, yes, um, I was intrigued what you said about when he was stalked in London by, was it Pitt? Or? Yes, Thomas Pitt. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And after that, his reputation sort of died. Mm. And, and he's obviously quite a big guy in terms of his work, well, what he did and so forth. Yes. Was it a class thing, do you think? That, that, uh... Well, I think in that sense, I mean, it, it probably was that... So he, his, he, he, he died in relative obscurity for a number of reasons. One is that he fell out with the, the elites, the powers that be. Yeah. You know, Thomas Pitt was extremely well connected, as I was saying. So that, I think, is one reason. Another reason was that when he published his book, um, it wasn't fated in the way that the Cook voyages were fated. Um, at the time, England was then, about to, or Britain was about to embark on a war with Spain, and then soon after with France, and then Napoleon's France. So there were other reasons. Then, then some of his great achievements, like, or you say achievement, we could argue were achievements, but you know, uh, uh, arranging for Hawaii to be you know, closely allied with Britain. Um, uh, maybe, maybe even a colony, and the, the, you know, the work around New Georgia in, in straddling America and, and Canada. Those were never taken up, in a the sense they're one of the ifs, great ifs of history. What would have happened if Britain had sought to build on the work that he did in Hawaii and the work he did in New Georgia? But they didn't, they had other, other things to think about. And there was probably some fatigue around um, colonies in America, uh, a lot of their focus was on Australia as a penal colony and also India with the East India Company. Um, so I think those are some of the other factors which explain why, why he wasn't recognised at the time. But of course, as I was saying, in subsequent years, 
His reputation has climbed. He's recognized in America and amongst the sort of role uh, at the American Navy circles as being, you know, a hydrographer of, of, of the equal of Cook, for instance. Um, but that's taken time, and he didn't have that uh, you know, during his lifetime. Thank you. I'll take one, one, one more question, and then I think we should go downstairs and we'll have more questions if you want, want to join the mingle. Thank you for your excellent talk. I'm just a little bit interested to know, uh, having been to Vancouver and Vancouver Island, uh, when um, he sailed through, uh, presumably there was nothing there at all. Uh, presumably it was just um, well, wilderness. Nothing. Well, there were na obviously native peoples. Sorry? There were native peoples there. Native, native people, um, but no, no but He settlers. was the first person to navigate round the island. Yeah. He proved what they call its insularity. Yeah. He proved that it was an island. Yeah. Um, so that was one thing. And of course, he didn't have any um, maps to go on. So of course, he was navigating as he went mm -hmm. along. Mm -hmm. And the ships they used were typically um, sort of collier-type ships, relatively um, flat-bottomed. Um, that would mean that you know if they they could they could go into unusual places and not get uh, not get stranded. Was that, does that answer your question? Pretty well, yes. I just wondered whether, when Vancouver was developed as a, as a city, presumably in the 19th century. So, yes, well, the city was, didn't exist, you know, and, and if you saw some of the... You uh, answered my question, yeah. Yes, that's right, yeah, yeah. I know there are more questions, but we are going to go downstairs and have a drink, and you're very welcome to, to talk to Simon <laughs> and to ask him on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, I miscounted. It's actually 107 people here, because there was three people in, in the gallery. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sure you want to uh, join me in thanking Simon for an excellent talk. Thank you.